Hello and welcome to Community Connection. I'm Iowa City Mayor Bruce Teague. We're six months into the COVID-19 pandemic, and while we've learned a great deal, there is still a lot of uncertainty about the virus. Today, I'm gonna to be joined by one of the leading members of the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics to discuss the coronavirus. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Teresa Brennan, Chief Medical Officer at UIHC. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for joining me. You bet, glad to be here. I am so excited to talk to you um, because coronavirus, we are still here after six months. Yeah. And the University of Iowa, I wanna learn like what have you all been doing uh, really at, at how you're looking at coronavirus different during this time? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things we've said from the beginning is one consistent with coronavirus has changed. Um, so we've continued to learn a lot. Um, but a lot of the things that we put into place very early on, we've continued to do and to really try to evolve into a, you know, a more optimal, perfect model. Um, we continue to see a lot of patients in our telemedicine clinic um, who are being assessed for coronavirus symptoms, as well as having them be seen in our uh, in, um, uh, influenza-like illness clinic um, where they can get tested. We continue to have what we call our home treatment team, which is a group of our physicians and advanced practice providers who are connecting with our patients on a daily or every other day basis um, to make sure that they're progressing through their illness for those patients who have tested positive for COVID-19. Um, we feel like that has really helped to keep patients out of the hospital, um, to give them some you know, peace and um, understanding of what to expect and, and to really monitor their progress by monitoring blood pressures and heart rates and their oxygen saturation. Um, and then we've done a lot of, a lot of things to, to create uh, a really safe place for our patients here. Um, you know, we've got a, a pretty big um, institution where we have a lot of people on site. Um, and we want to make sure that everyone who comes here, whether it's a patient or our visitors, continues to be safe. There's been a lot learned since the virus has emerged. And you just went through like a litany of things that uh, you all have been doing at the University of Iowa. But some of the things have remained somewhat constant, such as the preventative ways to not get COVID. Yes. And so tell us a little bit about what are what are some things that people can do that will decrease their risk of getting COVID? Yeah, I, I think the, the big thing is um, to, to really try to distance. Um, so we've talked about that from the beginning. Um, the second is to make sure that you have a face covering. Um, and the third is to continue to wash your hands. And so all of these things have been things that that we either started talking about, we talked about distancing and we talked about washing our hands um, uh, in the beginning and, and adding a face covering has been something that has been um, done very early on um, as well. So distancing, covering your um, face with, with some sort of face covering and washing your hands. Yeah, and I, I would agree that those are some of the things that we have to continue to do to ensure that we can decrease our risk. Um, I wanted to just talk a little bit about the, the criteria for the COVID-19 testing. What does that yeah. look like for someone to be able to come to University of Iowa City, uh, the University of Iowa uh, hospitals and clinic and say, hey, I want to test. What criteria would they have to meet in order to do that? That is one thing that has um, really evolved over time. So if you remember back when we first started testing, it was a very small population of people. It was those highest risk people who had very, very con convincing symptoms. Um, and now it's evolved into um, really two groups. So we test patients who have symptoms that are consistent with coronavirus infection. It could be coronavirus, it could be something else, but, but they're concerned about it. And then the other group we're testing is the asymptomatic patients. Um, for those that are symptomatic, we continue to ask them to go through um, a specific pathway because we want to make sure we keep them isolated from the rest of our patients. We wanna make sure that we're doing things very consistent consistently. And we also want to make sure um, that they get rapid access. And so we've created this um, telemedicine uh, linked with the in influenza illness, like illness clinic to get patients evaluated and tested promptly um, if they're symptomatic. The other group is the asymptomatic patients. Um, and there's, there's different patients that um, uh, we test within that asymptomatic group. 
Um, we are continuing to test every patient that gets admitted to our hospital to make sure that they're not carrying the virus when they come in that could be transmitted to other patients or to our staff. Um, we continue to test patients that are coming in for a procedure or an operation. If they're going to have a surgery tomorrow, they would get a test today. And the other group that we're testing uh, is patients who have been exposed and, and really focused on the high-risk exposure patients. So someone who has been in contact with someone with known coronavirus, so they've tested positive, the person in contact. They've um, been within uh, six feet of that person for more than 15 minutes and not wearing protective face covering. Um, so those uh, exposed people, we are testing um, in, at intervals uh, throughout their, their um, quarantine time. Um, we had been doing that at about 10 days and recently have added doing uh, an intermediary test in the, in the middle of that. So at about four to five days. Um, and that really was, was added because some patients don't have symptoms. And if they actually acquire the virus, but they don't have symptoms, but could pass it on to someone, we want them to be extra cautious about um, staying in isolation. So you talked about the people that can get the test. But one yes. of the biggest questions that I get all the time is, where do I even start the process to even be considered for a test? So where do people go? Yeah, if, if you're one of our patients or you want to have the test done with us, um, you go through our telemedicine pathway. Um, so you can make an appointment if you're one of our patients through your MyChart, um, or there's um, information on our website about how to get a telemedicine visit. Um, that's with a provider. They ask you, do you have symptoms? Have you had an exposure? Um, it's a very short visit. Uh, and the goal really is to fast track uh, a patient into then going to our influenza-like illness clinic where they might just have a drive-through test. So um, it's very slick. I've actually had it done myself. I woke up one day with some symptoms um, and had it done and it was very slick. And fortunately I was negative, but, um, but I got to see the process and the, and the process works very well. I did the same process and mine came back negative. So I didn't realize that it would make your eye just like water. So it, it was, uh, it was quite the process, but I was very happy to have experienced you know, the process of, of actually going through and getting the test. Because the, the criteria has changed, how many people are you administering the test to a day? Yeah, it's several hundred, um, up to a thousand patients to date um, per day we're, we're testing. Um, that is still within our capacity. Um, so we have the ability to, to do more um, and uh, continuously look at opportunities of how we can improve our processes, add equipment, add people to increase those numbers. So one of the things the University of Iowa was, was concerned about was overwhelming the hospitals at, mm -hmm. at one point. Yeah. We've, we have an increased spike here in Iowa City and surrounding area right now in Johns County. So how, how is your capacity looking right now? Yeah, so we, um, we struggle with capacity on a regular basis. We are full um, and have been for the last uh, several years where, you know, we, uh, when we discharge a patient, we have a patient ready for that bed. So we're pretty used to managing capacity. Um, I can tell you from a COVID-19 uh, patient standpoint, um, our, our capacity has been quite fine. Um, we have a surge plan. We know what we're going to do if we increase our capacity beyond what we're able to take care of today. Um, but we have plenty of ventilators, um, and on average, we're seeing about 20 patients in our hospital at any given time. Um, we saw a tiny bit of an increase um, over the summer, um, but it's really settled out in the low 20s. So we're getting into flu season. I don't know if you've noticed uh, the change in weather. I have on a turtleneck today, a mock turtleneck. Um, but so we're getting into flu season. Weather is changing holiday season as well. So we can, end, what do you anticipate seeing with the flu season and the COVID symptoms and gatherings? What, what do you anticipate um, with a change in just time? Yeah, so when I think about this, I, I think about best and worst case scenarios. Um, so I'll start with the worst case scenarios and end with the best. So worst case scenario is that COVID ramps up again. Um, because people who have been socializing outside now are moving inside and, and for various other reasons um, that we have a bit of an outbreak of COVID and we have a bad flu season. 
Um, so really, really important that each of us um, strongly consider, even if you haven't done it in the past, getting a flu shot. Um, the flu shot is an important part of preventing um, influenza. And fortunately, the other things that we are doing for COVID have the potential to prevent influenza as well. Um, so that's the best case scenario. So the best case scenario is because we're doing all of these good things with keeping our distance from others, with you know covering if we're coughing, making sure we're wearing that face mask, washing our hands very frequently. Um, the best case scenario is hopefully we won't have a terrible flu season. Um, and uh, then it won't overwhelm um, either hospitals or just our community. Um, it has a significant impact on our community, on businesses, um, on, on everything, when our schools, when um, we have outbreaks of viruses. Uh, so, so I'm hoping for that best case scenario um, that we can keep COVID at a steady state until we get a vaccine. Um, and that, um, that because of the good things we're doing and hopefully because the members of our community will get a flu vaccine, that we can keep influenza at a low rate. The, the discussion of gatherings, boy, that's a really hard one, isn't it? Um, yes. You know, I come from a big family and, you know, we, we get together in the fall and winter for, you know, Thanksgiving and Christmas. And that's a time we all look forward to because we don't see each other um, regularly throughout the year necessarily. Um, gatherings are gonna be really challenging um, and will be a place that there will be spread of, of COVID-19 if we don't have a successful vaccine before then. Um, so, you know, I would encourage all of us to start thinking about how we can do things differently this year. It's, it's a really um, heart um, wrenching idea that you can't gather with your family. Um, but if we could do it for one more, one year, just a few more months, um, perhaps we can get ourselves out of, out of this COVID situation. I think one thing with, since we've been here since March in our community, in our state, I really believe that people are learning as we're going along how they can keep themselves safe, even when it feels awkward and weird. Like when I go to my mom's house, you know, we're there uh, when there's a large gathering, which we, we, I've only been to one large gathering. It was for a funeral and we social distance. We had mask on and, you know, even when you ate, you kind of spaced yourself out because we're not all from the same household. So at least in my, in my personal family, we, we went that extra mile, and I think that's something that uh, people in the community, um, gonna, they're going to have to figure out what works for them. Uh, we've learned a lot. You know that you know, if you're within uh, 15 minutes of someone um, that is positive, you can get it. And so that, I, I believe that knowledge changes behaviors. And so, I would agree. Yeah, so I'm hopeful. I'm very hopeful. Yeah, I would agree. I, the other couple of things that I think about that I think you touched on, but just to kind of put an exclamation point um, is when you're not in the same family um, or in the same household. And, and if you're going to gather, really thinking about who you're gathering with and what their practices are. Are they following those safety practices outside of that gathering? Um, because if they are, that actually keeps you safer, right? Um, the second thing um, I think about is, you know, is it necessary or is it elective? And, and if, you know, a funeral, of course, that, that's something that's really hard to miss. Um, but, um, but maybe a gathering of family in the fall could be postponed till the summertime next year mm -hmm. um, and have a different kind of gathering. And then the last thing I think about is how is it going to impact you individually? So how would it impact me to go to, um, to a gathering? How does my medical condition have an impact? How, how will it impact my work if I get COVID-19? Um, so just thinking about those um, different factors and then, and then making a decision. Um, I will point out, you, you mentioned eating. Eating yes. is for sure a, a time when um, we have seen um, and have in, in patients who have turned positive, we have seen that that is definitely a risk factor because you have to take off your PPE in order to do that. Um, and we are human beings. It's, um, it's great if you can keep yourself distanced, but many times when you sit down at a table and have a meal with people, it's really hard to keep that distance. Absolutely. All right, so the university is one of the world leading research centers uh, uh, in, in, in the world, actually. What are some of the notable things, since you all are frontline with the COVID-19, what are some of the notable things that you all are doing to try to impact um, COVID-19 um, and, and turn it around? And 
since we've you've had a lot of patients, have you learned anything about the after effects of COVID-19? Yeah, really great questions. So we talked a little bit about our operational changes of um, making sure we can see patients rapidly and, um, and that follow-up um, to keep people out of the hospital. When people become hospitalized, we've learned a, a lot about how you treat the patient in the moment um, and how different forms of ventilation are really important. Um, and, and so a lot has been learned about, about that and, and as well what organs seem to be impacted. Um, a lot more is coming out about the heart, um, which is you know, of course near and dear to me since I'm a cardiologist. Um, from a, a research standpoint, we have clearly um, been a part of many studies. Um, the, the convalescent plasma study, we've um, collected plasma from more than 100 individuals who have had COVID-19 and then given it um, to nearly the same number of patients. We were a part of remdesivir trial, which is that antiviral, the, mm -hmm. the medication that impacts the virus itself. Um, uh, and uh, um, have been using that uh, since um, nearly the beginning of when it was, was being used. Um, we're really fortunate to have had uh, for a long time a group of researchers who have really specialized in looking at coronavirus. And, and I'm not talking about um, the coronavirus that we're fighting now necessarily, but talking about just the gamut of different kinds of coronavirus. Because they're in the same family, there's commonalities. And, and they've actually created a mouse model to look at um, what, what sort of therapies might be effective that we haven't already used. Um, also have research trials uh, looking at other medications um, that um, may impact um, coronavirus. So we're really proud of our researchers um, and the work that they're doing and, and the impact that they're having on the potential treatment and prevention of patients in the future. The, the last thing um, that I will speak about um, is the long-term effects. So yes. you asked about the long-term effects. So in um, June, our uh, lung doctors actually opened up a follow-up COVID clinic um, for patients who have had COVID-19 who continue to have some symptoms, um, you know, three or four weeks out when their convalescence really should have gotten them back to we, what we would hope is their, their normal condition, but they're not quite back there yet or they're having a lot of symptoms and they need a, a different evaluation. Um, so they're collecting data and it's really too early for us to, to tell, but, but um, early on what we're hearing from them is it, it doesn't necessarily matter if you had a very bad case of coronavirus or COVID-19 or you've had a milder case, um, they're still seeing that some people continue to have symptoms. Um, they're doing a, um, a protocol driven uh, evaluation where they're, they're evaluating the patient of course um, listening to their lungs and then getting some testing. Um, so each patient would get lung breathing tests, each patient would get uh, a chest x-ray and a CT scan of their lungs. And we are in the process now of um, working on opening up a more dedicated clinic for patients who have had heart disease related to the coronavirus because we know that it can cause inflammation or something called myocarditis. What we don't know is uh, what the long-term effects are. And I think many of us have taken solace, me included, in um, the fact that, that the outbreak that we had in Johnson County really was not um, in the groups that would get hospitalized, that, that it seemed to be in the younger population with, with a hope that they would have milder disease, which they generally do, and um, that you know, they wouldn't have any, any long-term effects. And um, right now we don't know what the potential long-term effects mm -hmm. are, but, but I think that data will come out. It'll probably be um, months to even years before we, we actually know clearly. Well, I'm hoping for the best uh, for everybody that has experienced it, of course. And thank you, of course, to all of the, uh, uh, the University of Iowa um, individuals that are monitoring the COVID virus on various aspects. You have great staff that are putting their own selves at risk because no matter how much PPE they wear, they're still putting themselves at risk. Question that I have that is burning uh, vaccine. <laughs> vaccine. What can you tell us? Uh, give us some insight. Um, are you all working on anything or do you, yeah. uh, what can we expect? Because we are hoping for an end of, uh, of this at some point. Hoping and praying, I think, for most of us that, yes. that the end is coming and that hopefully it's coming soon, um, but um, yet to be seen. So, 
Um, we are a part of one of the vaccine trials. Um, we uh, have a, a great set of researchers who have participated in um, many uh, vaccine developments and vaccine trials over the, the many years. Um, so we, um, we're, we're pretty well equipped to, to uh, be a part of one of the vaccine trials. Um, our enrollment actually uh, at one point, and I think still, um, uh, has outpaced the nation. So we've done a really good job. Iowans have been great about um, opting in and becoming part of the vaccine trial. Um, it's a randomized trial, either you get it or you don't. Um, and so we hope that that we'll see some results. Um, the one thing though, that I think is important that, um, that we learned and, and actually we, we've known for a while, but, but many people may not know is generally you don't get more than one vaccine at the same time. And so one of the things that, that I would encourage your listeners to think about um, is getting your flu shot and getting it early because if the vaccine becomes available in general, uh, we want to have some time between the flu vaccine and the COVID-19 vaccine. So, so get your flu shot early um, and, and hopefully we'll have some news. Um, you know, it takes time. And of course, the, the most important things when you're trialing a vaccine is first, is it safe? Um, and uh, uh, most of them are looking to be safe. I know one of them was put on hold um, to assess a, an, an adverse event that it had occurred. And then secondly, is it effective? Um, and so I, I think the vaccine trial that we're, be, we're a part of has, has shown that there is good safety, um, at least so far. Um, the data is yet to be evaluated. Um, but is it effective? And so that will take a little bit of time, um, but hopefully soon we'll have some um, some outcomes. Um, and by soon, I'm, I'm meaning hopefully in a few months, probably not a few days or weeks. Yes, well, I'll tell you, any type of hope is, is, is worth waiting for because this has been quite the couple of months for many of us uh, when we're talking about uh, those that have been affected personally by having COVID-19 and all the other effects that it's caused within the community, within families, it, within schools, is it's a hardship. And so this is a real crisis. Absolutely. You know, many times we don't think about viruses or infections having such a widespread impact on our community, but it, it is amazing to think about. Um, I appreciate your your comments about our employees and how hard they're working and, and what a great job they're doing, but but also our paramedics and our firemen and our policemen um, who are out on the front lines and you know putting themselves at, at potential risk of acquiring COVID-19, but but our business owners, some of whom have lost their, their businesses because of this, you know, our kids going back to school um, or not. And and the so the and, and then our individual um, impacts um, from the beginning, our, our team has really worked um, for our team on wellness. Um, the isolation, the not being able to do the things that you're normally used to doing, the fear and anxiety of the virus, all of those have a personal impact on each of us. And so um, it has had just a widespread, um, really mostly negative impact, right? Um, I do say that sometimes we see some silver linings um, of things that have happened as a result of us addressing COVID-19. But for the most part, it's just been a real hardship. Um, and, you know, it, it really, um, for many of us, we're just tired of it. And so I would encourage the, the listeners to um, just keep, uh, keep it up for a few more months. Um, and I really believe that we can get out of this. All right. So thank you again for joining me today. And yes, I, I sing the praises of the staff and, and all of the other people that you mentioned, the firefighters, the law enforcement, the business owners. And um, many of them have um, really struggled a little bit trying to adjust with the change in how they operate. And yeah. I, I mean, there's so many, every, we're all affected in some way. And so again, thanks to you. And our teachers. I forgot Abs our teachers. How could I forget yeah, our teachers? Absolutely. And the world of Zoom. How about that? You know, uh, we, are, we are not in the same presence of people, um, you know, on a great scale. And so in closing, is there anything that you would like to share as we end our time here today? No, I, I just to thank you for all the hard work that you've put in. I mean, there's a lot of irons in the fire for you as well. Um, and to encourage people to continue the safety practices, even though it's exhausting and it's been a long time, um, get your flu shot um, and do all the things that, that you can do to, to stay safe. Um, and if you have a medical condition that needs treatment, 
you know, certainly um, assess the, the institution you're going to for how good their safety practices are. We, we are working very hard to make sure that um, every day for every patient and every staff it's safe. Um, but really, please don't neglect your health just because of concern for potential COVID. Do all the right things. Go, go to a place that's doing all the right things and, and get your great care. All right. Well, there you have it. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Brennan. You bet. Have a great day. Stay safe. Yes, you as well. That's our show for today. For more health resources and updates, visit icgov.org slash coronavirus. There you will also find details for the city's face covering order. We'll be back again next week with more episodes of Community Connection. Until then, remember to wear your mask, practice good hygiene, and social distance from others. We're all in this together, Iowa City.